session post lunch the first session uh, uh, please welcome Ivan he will be talking us uh, today about natural task scheduling Ivan <laughs> can start okay thanks uh, so essentially the first thing that I want to do is to apologize because there will be a lot of template meta programming code in the slides so if Walker's presentation didn't scare you off I hope that this this one will <laughs> I hate showing code in the slides, but essentially it's much better than just going scrolling through through a real file or something like that. So before we start uh, doing anything concrete, as Walker did, first I need to explain to you why should we use template method programming and all the stuff that I'm going to present. Just imagine having a, a simple algorithm that you want to implement. So your boss gave you a graphical representation. You obviously hate it. And you decide to implement it in the most straightforward way that you can think of. And this is something that uh, somebody from high, high school could also write. What's the problem with the code that you see? Any ideas? It blocks. Essentially, every method here, or most of the methods here, are blocking. Essentially, get username, check if user exists, get password, initialize account, and things like those. You could have done this in a single user console application, but you can't do anything similar in a real world system. For example, you're implementing a web server or something like that. Then, what can you do? Just for the time being, uh, forget signal slots and things like those. Firstly, we started using callback functions. And then you get a code that looks like this. Instead of having one logical hole that implements your algorithm, you have a login method that does absolutely nothing apart from calling get username, which should, when the username is available, then call on got username and stuff like those. Is this code readable? For me, it really isn't. It, you can read it. You can maybe understand for this simple example what it does. But just imagine a complex system. So we started with a rather simple graphical diagram. And we ended up, after implementation, with something like this. It is as readable as the code that you, get, that you generated. And in this diagram, at least I tried to keep the pairs of calls and callbacks in the same place so that you at least can see that those should be connected in some, some way or another. And we can, uh, the only picture that I have is the perfect representation of what, of what you get in a complex system. You get a spaghetti code. This is uh, a structure done by George Hart. And it represents perfectly what we had in the last slide. You have a lot of spaghetti around the event loop that you're using in the back end. And that's called the inversion of control, because it's not you who are making the calls anymore. It's the event loop. So instead of you calling a function, somebody else does it for you. Uh, in literature, you would uh, find it an under inversion of control. So what are the reasons for waiting? Uh, you can wait for the user input, network actions. You can communicate with the GPU and all the things that uh, are listed here. And I don't want to read my, my own slides. And you can, for example, wait for a process, like in the fourth picture. You want to call a process. You want to get its output and parse it somehow and get a value. You can't really control when it starts. It's under control of the OS. You can't control when it will finish. The same goes for the network connections and similar things. And usually, we don't really see the problem. Because nice people at Qt or Boost or wherever are tend, tend to wrap up all those nice things in a smart objects. Essentially, when I want to get a web page from the internet, I want to get a web page. I don't want to create 
another object to pass it which page I want to get and then get a signal for when the page was retrieved. I want a page. So we tend to wrap a lot of things in objects that make things more complicated than, than they should. Either that or we are using POSIX select, uh, which has a timeout if there is nothing to, to return and stuff like that. And what is the current, uh, current mode of getting things like those is you, by using the, some kind of future classes. Instead of creating an object, then doing all the things that we already mentioned, you should just have a method that, that goes like get a web page, you pass URL, and it returns a future web page. When the future is available, then you react on it. And that's the most simplest asynchronous uh, API that could exist. In Qt, we have a couple of those. Uh, Q future, which I'm not going to bash <laughs> too much today. Uh, Debus spending reply or network connections and stuff like those. Uh, in standard, uh, there is a stood, stood future and boost obviously has boost future. So what are the continuations? The continuations are kind of abstraction over all of these concepts. Essentially, if you read it in, a, in the literature, you would see it's a continuation monad and stuff like that if you like Haskell. And I'm not going to, to go that way. I'm not going to talk about callbacks. You already know what those are and signals a slot as well. What is a continuation? If you are able to tell when a process ends, you're able to schedule another process after it. Essentially, the continuation is the second process. Is that OK? In the future, uh, C++ standard, I don't think it will be for 14, probably for 17. Uh, the future, met, uh, future class will have a dot then method. Uh, Boost already does it in 155. It should be released in a month or so. So essentially, if somebody returns you a future of, for example, a string, you can say that future dot then call this function on the result when you get it. The thing that is if deft out would block the caller until the future is available. We never want to block the caller, so never write a code like that and never write it in a Qt or anywhere else. We want to have a code that when the future is available, it will call our Lambda and in Lambda, we can freely call .get without blocking because the future is already here. But then we come to a problem. .then method is supported, will be supported only by std future and boost future. Can you call a normal value and call a .then? For example, if you don't have an asynchronous API, but you have, for example, get me a number of CPUs, it will return an int. So you have, you need to handle different types of values in a different manner. In the sense of, for a normal value, you just, sorry, you just call continuation of i, because you already have the value. For boost and the standard, you just call dot then. For QFuture, you have a lot of fun. You need to create a watcher, then connect the finished signal from the watcher to a lambda that then calls the continuation and deletes the watcher, which is the, the worst API that I have ever seen in my life. Or to, to be more precise, the worst modern API that I've seen in my life. KJob does one thing better, it doesn't need a watcher, so you can directly connect to its finished signal. The problem with kjob is that it doesn't return a value. It's a job, and if you want to get a value from it, you can put it as a cute property or something like that. So essentially, we have a really crappy place where the C++ programming language doesn't support 
dot then for anything. So it's something that is implemented in the libraries and not in the core language. Can we fix that without changing the core language? And enter templates. So essentially we want to make a generic function that will be able to get two jobs as as the arguments, it will execute the first job, and when the first job ends, we'll execute the second one. Is that okay? And the API is quite clear. What isn't clear is how we are dealing with continuations that have an argument versus the continuations that don't have an argument. Uh, uh, who knows using in C++11? Okay, for the rest of you, just read it as type def. Type def with reversed arguments. So we are defining a new type that's called is nullary, and it, its value, let's say it like that, is whether the continuation can be cast to a std function that gets no arguments. This can be done in a optimized way, but I think th this is the clearest for, for the audience. If we can cast something to a nullable std function, then it's a nullable function, right? The main thing to, to note is that this doesn't create a type. You have no instances of a type. It, it's just something that compiler checks while, you're implement, while compiling. So it's absolutely zero overhead on your execution code. Then we are using overloading, uh, calling a helper function that passes a value that the first job returns, forwards the continuation object, and passes an instance of the aforementioned type. Again, this can be done in a much, in a bit clearer way, but it works as it is. So. What we are doing, the first thing that we want to cover is the most generic case. When the first job returned something that we have absolutely no idea what it is, we'll consider it's a normal value. So we'll consider that it's an int or Q string or whatever. In that case, the only thing that we need to do is what we had in the first slide with int, int i, just call the continuation. Two overloads, the first one handles the null when the continuation is nullable, and the second one as the default type uh, when the continuation is not nullable. And you can do obviously static assert to check whether the continuation does ex uh, receive exactly one argument. So this is one of the things that made me fell in love with C++ for the second time the sick things that you can do with the type system while the compiler is compiling. The next step is to implement this function for the queue future. If the first task returned a queue future, then we have the same code that we already did. If the future is already finished, call the continuation immediately, else create the watcher and everything else. The compiler will know if it's a queue future of some type. It's a specialized template of what we saw on the previous slide, so it will know which one to call. And as the last part, uh, obviously boost and standard future. <coughs> nah, I don't want to go to that slide yet. So in essence, uh, we want to, to be able to use anything that has a dot .den method. Usually what we do as object-oriented programmers are to create a superclass or super in interface or whatever that will have a virtual dot .den and everybody will just inherit from that. We can't make std future inherit from our class. For boost, may we might, I don't know. But why would you introduce a virtual method just for polymorphism? <laughs> Uh, by the long phase. Uh, essentially, virtuals are for the real runtime polymorphism. You can do awesome things in C++ statically if you, in this case, you can. Essentially, you can write a simple 
a structure that will check whether a class has a dot then or not and has a dot then that has a single argument that is passed as a template parameter archetype. So the way you would use something like this is has then method uh, less than the first type that you want to check, say the type that you want to, uh, to pass as the argument type. And column column value would return you true or false. Is it okay? <laughs> So essentially, code like this is based on something called substitution failure is not an error or a sfine, which means that when we want to, when we do this decal type here, it will try to call a test method with this argument for the template and pass it an null pointer. It will try first to match the, my mouse, is, is, it, is it visible? Okay. So it will try to call this one. This one will be able to be called only if the structure U has a column, column, then. Otherwise, if we, if we were not able to match on that function, it will match the second one. And it will use uh, the return value, std column, column, true type or false type, to initialize our using type here. So this is something that I found that not many C++ programmers know about at all. And it's a static introspection. It's a really tedious static introspection, but it works nevertheless. And if you try to read standard C++ lab library, you'll have a lot of these. OK. So the next step. Pretend that we somehow managed to force everybody to use dot then notation, even cute KD and everybody else. You could write something like this. If you have a chain of jobs that should be executed one after another, you could just do get username dot then something, get password dot then something, and similar things. The code is localized, uh, easier to understand, than the original one, but it's still not really what we want. We want to be able to, to write code like this. We want to be able to write normal code and for the compiler to just do all the magic behind the scenes to know which methods are asynchronous, to know which methods are not, and to collect everything in, in a whole bunch and we, drew, we would just write this. It can't be done. So essentially, if we were able to use this syntax, it would mean that we are able to change C++ in a way is un unimaginative, <laughs> uh, unimaginable, oh, damn it, <laughs> imaginable. Uh, so we can't really um, change the semantics of a C++ language. If somebody says username equals get username brackets brackets, C++ will execute the get username method and it will assign the result to username. It will call the operator equal, obviously. But we can do something like this. Essentially, really, really the same, almost the same syntax. We are not able to use semicolons anymore. We are not able to use curly braces anymore, but this is the next best thing, right? Now, this becomes a simple serial block, so serial execution of whatever is inside. Username equals something is the first argument of the function. The password goes the same for the rest of the things. It's weird, but it's definitely more readable than call callback soup that we had in the beginning. And how do we implement something like this? Walker and Dario before mentioned variadic templates. Essentially, a template that can have unlimited number of arguments. Or in the case of Microsoft Visual Studio, something 10. Uh, and any number of arguments that are less than 12. <laughs> but OK. What do we do? We create a serial class, which will eventually be specialized for different 
uh, job types. But in the beginning, we just say, OK, it can have as many template arguments as we, as we wish it to have. Then we specialize for the empty list. Just uh, processing the variadic templates is just like processing lists in any functional programming language. You define something for the empty list, and then you define it for the head and the tail. So for the empty list, what should we do? We should just say, OK, we have finished already. We have nothing to execute. If we have a head and a tail, then we start the head. And when the head finishes, we start the tail. Is it OK? This part of the code compiles only on Clang 3.2 because, <laughs> because of a slight bug in GCC that I haven't submitted yet. But essentially, this can be written in a more compiler-friendly way. Uh, the reason I chose this approach is that I don't really want to base anything on QFuture, and I'm at a Qt conference. So I just had to <laughs> use QFutures and just dump anything just to make it work. The same as with the serial execution, you can define a while loop either in the left syntax or if you prefer the right one where you have different blocks. Branching as well, you can define it in a less convenient syntax or in a perfect that looks almost like the real code. And everything is kind of cool, right? You can create a task for asynchronous assignment. So you are able to write as a task i equals some function. You can create a parallel execution schedule which will start how many processes you want, wait for them to finish, and then report that it has finished. You can detach immediately. You, can, you don't really need to wait for every task, which uh, we will see it in example a uh, couple of minutes later. So the main thing to, uh, to say here, nothing relies on threading. So although it's called detach, it doesn't mean, OK, let's move it in a separate thread and run it elsewhere. It can work perfectly with any uh, reactive programming library like Boost, Asynchronous I.O., or something like that. So essentially, you can write a whole server without using multiple threads and have it done in a nice way. You can write a transaction schedule, or which would if some task fails, just roll back and execute undo on previous tasks. You can do anything that you want. And that's one of the things why I fell in love in functional programming and later when I discovered these things in C++. OK. We have a quite a stupid example, which uh, should show some messages. And for each message, it will wait. If we run it synchronously, obviously, the UI is blocked. And we are waiting, and we are waiting, and we are still waiting. We can't do anything else because our main thread is completely OK. <laughs> when it finishes, the GUI thread again starts working, and everything is repainted and works perfectly. If we run the code in a synchronous way, obviously, the GUI continues working. And with each new message, it gets updated, which is something that you would expect, right? What does the code look like? OK, this is the synchronous one. And this is the asynchronous one. It's line by line equivalent. The only reason why I put serial inside of another serial is that to demonstrate that I can. And again, I just made a block inside another block just to see the, uh, to compare the, the, the two versions. So the code is the same. 
apart from the curly braces and semicolons. But now you say, OK, this is a stupid example. And I'm not going to show you anything else. But uh, what if you could write a WebSocket server like this? I did. <laughs> it's using Boost as here. And what, what am I doing? The first line says, OK, we are waiting for a client. As soon as the client arrives, we are calling the next part of the while loop. OK, calling detach move it somewhere else, again, not in a separate thread, and execute some serial commands that, is a, that re represent a handshake for the WebSocket server. Is it much simpler than anything that you would ever be doing with call callbacks? For me, it is. But there is one thing that I, as a marketing guy, here uh, failed to mention. If you do something like this, what did we say that in C++ get header brackets means? It means that that method should be executed as soon as the argument is evaluated. So instead of having a method that returns a normal value, unfortunately, you need to have some kind of method to return a task. How can we do it in modern C++? Or not that modern. You can use std bind, which will bind a method uh, and the arguments and create a functor object for you to call with just empty braces. And I really don't like spraying my code all over with std binds. So if you don't want to do something like that, you can make wrappers. And honestly, I still don't really like making wrappers. What, would, what are we doing here? We are declaring we have um, some method in the detail namespace, because we don't want to export that one directly to the user. And we are creating a wrapper that uses std bind, but when you use that method, you don't really see it anymore. And this is kind of still ugly, right? You would have to, for all your methods in a library, to write ugly, ugly wrappers. The nice wrapper that I posted a few months ago on Planet KDE is called curry. Unfortunately, it's not real currying in the sense of uh, who knows what currying is. <laughs> cool. OK, just imagine for the sakes of simplicity, that currying is a method to convert any function into a function, mm, any argument function into a single argument function that returns n minus 1 argument function, which is not anymore n minus 1, but 1. And then instead of calling, for example, sort of 1, 2, 3, you would be able to call sort of 1, of 2, of 3, or 4, and so on. It doesn't really make much sense in C++ to do it that way. So the implementation here does something really dirty. And fortunately, there are not many Haskell coders here. And they'll stay alive after this. Uh, it does something much better than forcing you to call it one argument after another. You can choose as many arguments as you want. So, But if you don't some specify something, blah, 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 which I'm not going to mention, you need to finish your argument calling with the empty brackets. And the reason for that is exactly because I wanted to use it here. And that's one of the things that was, was mainly discussed on my, on, on my blog post. Because purists of functional programming languages said, ah, you don't need it to do it that way and stuff like that. But I needed it because of this conference. So essentially. It's a much, much simpler wrapper than the previous one. You don't even need to know which arguments some method receives in order to create a wrapper. You just say carry of some function. Uh, how much time? Hmm? <laughs> OK, this was too fast then, but no problem. So. What are the benefits of it all? You have code that 
you can really read and that you can understand what you wrote. You don't have to keep an, a mind image of what you did, what, where are the connections between different objects that you used. You get automatic lifetime management. That's something that I didn't talk about, but we'll return to. You, cre you can create your own control structures, as I already said, and which means that you can create anything that you desire and anything you wish in your project. So the problems are that it's a bit different syntax. You can't really express anything like A plus equals something. You can overload that. You can overload how many things you want. But you would always hit the limitation that, if I remember correctly, Boost Phoenix library does. Uh, Boost Phoenix was a library, if I remember correctly, for lambdas before lambdas existed. So they overloaded a hell of a lot of things just to make stuff like underscore plus to create a functor object and things like those. OK, the things that I forgot to mention was when we did, uh, let's go. OK, the variable at the beginning is called weight. It can't have a type of int. Who can tell me why? What would happen if we started something asynchronously that was defined in a, in an, as a local variable in a function? It would just crash, right? So it's, yeah? Uh, a monadic. Uh we need a monadic uh, variable to <laughs> to uh, say had to get the bind operator working. Okay, I want to talk to you <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so the the thing that that is a problematic here. If you create an int, it will be destroyed when you exit the function. You have you either need to have copied it already, or if you. I don't know, if you pass a reference like we usually do, not for ints, but for more complex stuff, you would get the crash because you would try to reference something that is destroyed. Is it OK? So essentially, mm, this, again, might be done in a more sane way. But what does var of int do? It's a reference, count, reference counted pointer like std shared pointer. It has a little bit of overhead because of the, all the reference counting, right? But it's only on entering some block or leaving some block. And you can try to hmm, do something like monadic binding so that you really have only one variable which is passed on thro from one thing to another. So essentially, the only overhead that you'll have here is by using the shared pointers. When I uh, first, the first version of the library that I played around with, when you compile it with obviously O3 optimizations, it is exactly the same code as if you called the, the functions directly. One of the cool things was I tested it by calling a few synchronous functions like printf or whatever. It was exactly the same, call by call, byte by byte. The coolest part was if you defined an inline function, even if you pass it through all of the hoops of indirection, it will again be inlined in your by I almost said bytecode, in your binary <laughs> binary executable. So everything here was once done via object inheritance and virtuals and stuff like that. The point of the talk, apart from demonstrating a couple of cool things is that I really advise everybody who doesn't like C++ as much as they used to to read upon some of the fancy fancy things regarding templates. One The, the book uh, which made me love C++ again was Alexandrescu's Modern C++ Design. Essentially, when you start reading it, you just, OK, this guy is weird, he's doing uh, uh, illegal things to templates. So he's violating templates by 
pushing everything into template arguments. And after that, you just stop thinking about C++ as an object-oriented language. It's a completely multi-paradigmal language, and you should tell everybody that it is. <laughs> OK, that should be, I think, everything that I wanted to say. These are the kudos, and you can ask questions as much as you wish. Thank you. What's wrong with coroutines? Why not use those? I mean, we, there's a library in Boost. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I started developing this and at the same time when the Boost coroutines were started, and I saw the Boost, uh, uh, the Boost can talk about them. Honestly, they are really, really powerful. But it's a completely different approach. Coroutines are more like, OK, we are going a little bit lower level to jump left and right. And they tried not to go lower level, but to abstract things up. Essentially, this can be implemented by using coroutines. The problems with coroutines that I see is that they allow too many weird, weird things for, to the developer. Sometimes it's really hard to see the code flow because people tend to jump from one routine to another in a completely erratic manner. And I, I saw that a couple of times with .NET developers because I think C Sharp or whatever introduced something called yield that does completely unexpected things apart from yielding to somebody else. And then one of my students asked me, although I have never in my life seen C Sharp, can you debug this for me? <laughs> I was like, OK, start the debugger, poof, poof, poof. What the fuck is going, <laughs> going on here? So that's the reason why I don't particularly like coroutines. It can, they can be really maliciously used. Um, it looked like um, uh, it, sorry. It, awesome. Um, ah. um, I like the way you uh, if you bring the uh, do syntax of Haskell <laughs> for the um, continuation monad into into C plus plus. Um, does your uh, approach also work for uh, other monads than the uh, continuation monad? Ha! <sighs> I really didn't uh, think about it at all. This was created because I needed it in a project. Uh, I know of a couple of really nice uh, functional C++ libraries that implement monads in a gen more generic way. Uh, I really currently, I don't care that much. <laughs> but I guess it could be used. No, Mike. <laughs> Um, what are the requirements for a, a programmer or a team to handle such a thing if there's not much knowledge in template meta programming? What happens if the, um, there's an error and you get compiler errors? <laughs> <laughs> compiler errors, uh, did you listen to Walker Krauss? Essentially, one of the things that he started preaching a couple of years ago is that you shouldn't look at the compiler errors uh, for the template programming as a compiler error. It is a backtrace of something that is executed during the compilation time. So if you start looking at it as a backtrace, then you can really see what the error means. And if the answer doesn't satisfy you, as I guess most of, <laughs> most of you are not satisfied with the answer, uh, there are tools that are in being developed by Clang uh, community that will decipher template errors. Uh, I, I haven't tried them yet. I just heard about the tool uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it was mentioned at the Going Native conference that Microsoft held somewhere in the United States. So it's being worked, upon, <laughs> worked on if you are unable to see the template errors like Volker does, then you can use a tool. 
otherwise you're screwed. <laughs> As, it, as you are if you're using any template stuff like STL. <laughs> I think um, I wouldn't use this stuff in one of our projects because the know-how know to handle this is so high that we cannot <laughs> use it in with, uh, with a group with five persons with different uh, knowledge. I agree. Uh, the problem with things like these is that we are missing a couple of features in C++ to make the error messages more readable. Uh, one of the things are the concepts, which would somehow uh, al allow us to put constraints of what you can pass to a template. So you wouldn't get an error uh, deep, tw 20 calls deep, you would get an original one stating your job doesn't have one argument. This is already done by the static assert command in some on some level, but most of the things, most of the errors that you can make would really lead to large large points. Okay. So that's the only advice. Well, the only advice that I want to give you is switch to a new compiler and learn template meta programming. <laughs> Okay. It's not that hard, and it's fun. <laughs> and this was very, very nice. One question. Um, what do you feel about something more standardized uh, looking so in this direction? Uh, do you have any ideas when, when something like this more uh, not so custom-made, like your, yeah. your solution, but maybe Boost or something like that? Uh, OK, well, Boost is usually custom made and somebody passes it to boost and somebody accepts it. This is still three different versions of the same library completely in prototype phases. So I can't, I wouldn't really recommend uh, anybody to actually use them. One of the proposals for, I think, C++17 is to introduce coroutines or something like that into the core language. Uh, or continuable functions, iterable function. I, I really can't remember the official name. The idea, uh, again, came from the Microsoft team and C Sharp, where you can, for example, if somebody something returns a future, you could say await for that. And then your method would automatically exit and stuff like that. The thing that I don't like about that approach is, again, it goes too low level and creates cup, a completely different sets of functions in the core language. Maybe it will end up as a C++17 feature. I don't know whether I'm hoping it will or it won't. So that's the most that, that I can say. Uh, me too. I think that uh, uh, I find hard to understand the C++ side of the implementation. How about using another language to glue <laughs> what you've written in C++? The idea is not yeah. mine. I read about yeah. it. <laughs> I don't remember where. Uh, where um, maybe it was Lee. Or <laughs> uh, I think that it's it's the obvious approach. But it's not as cool as doing template meta programming, right? <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, you could do it probably in a Q script or whatever the successor of Q script will be in a couple of years. But it's not your language anymore. And I'm not sure, because if you go that go at it that way you should implement STL with another language. Because SDL, STL has so many weird things when you try to, so this is really a tip of the iceberg what STL does. So if you don't like a library like this because it does something that you don't understand, really try reading the STL. It's, it's exhilarating. <laughs> But yeah, you can make a script language or something that would do similar things, not this optimized. Although, OK, you can make a code generator, which would then be compiled, and it would be optimized. But yeah, <laughs> this is more fun.
yeah, but in the language, in the host language, which is the important part. Okay. Well, any template programming is a code generation. If you de define a template, it will not end up in a binary until you define something, an instance of the template, right? Okay, may I ask? A uh, who, who, who? Okay. As <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so I know, I, I didn't see any error handling um, at all. So, cool. What about that? Uh, I skipped that because you can do error, error handling in a couple of different manners. The first implementation that that I did and that worked perfectly in one of the KD projects was to imitate the Unix kind of way. Uh, a task returns an int, and if it's uh, if it's zero, it's okay. If it's something else, it's an error message. Uh, otherwise, you can use. Um, if you haven't seen it, Alexandrescu's talk about expected t. Uh, so it's uh, kind of like uh, Haskell's option option monad. Uh, just apart from being able to have a value. Alternatively, it can hold an exception if the value is not available. And it, I don't really want to reiterate what Alexandrescu said. He's one of the greatest guys in C++, so I really urge you to all to, to find the talk. It's something like, I'm now talking out of my head, pretty error handling or something, something error handling by Alexandrescu. Because I, I always know that error handling is it's messing the code up. So, <laughs> well, it wouldn't mess this one. Okay. Because if you are passing STD future, the thing that you can do is just don't pass a value to the future, yeah. and then it's an error. So the API, the code, everything just says stays the same, but then you don't know which error it was, no. and that's why the expected of t would be a really, really a good match for this. So you said that uh, when using C++, this approach is, in your opinion, favorable uh, as opposed to uh, using coroutines. Uh, now, with the thing is, coroutines are uh, is a concept that works in other languages. So the developers coming from other languages, if they already know how to use coroutines, uh, they can easily uh, transfer and knowledge. Do you think that your approach could be applicable to other languages? Or is it so uh, so set on templates in C++ that it wouldn't be portable to other languages? So the implementation itself is really based on templates because I wanted it to be as performant as possible. But in any language that you have introspection in, you can do something similar. So for Java, you would just get method or whatever it's called, then call something, call something. So it can be ported, but I really don't care about other languages apart from maybe Haskell and Scala. <laughs> Any more questions? It's good that I finished early. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just a small detail. What I'm wondering about, you had this code where you check if the signal already arrived or if it's already finished, and mm -hmm. then you connect. And I'm kind of wondering. Uh, just a second. <laughs> this one? Uh, yeah. Um, so my question would be, what if when so the signal is emitted by another thread and there is just no receiver at that point? Is it omitted, the signal, or it, does it uh, reach the, uh, the queue and then when, you, when then the connect comes later, it's still, you still get it? OK, this thing relies on the queued smart logic. In essence, uh, what the uh, future watcher should do is even it, if it has finished and got a signal somehow, essentially the thread needs to notify the queue future that it has finished so for the queue future to be a proper one. And for us, it just makes no difference whether it's in the same thread or in, in a separate one. 
the signal will always arrive. At least the Qt uh, API sh guarantee that. But when you haven't connected then, because I mean, it could be that after you, you've asked uh, if it's finished, then only later you connect and the signal was emitted Okay, before. but uh, if it's not finished, if it is finished, we're just getting the result. If it's not finished, we're creating a watcher, connecting it in advance, and then set, setting the future. Um, then the watcher will check. Is the future finished? If it is, I'm calling the signal. The critical section uh, between finished and connected. Is there no race condition between not future finished, is finished and uh, connected? Even if it, if it happens, this means when we first checked, it wasn't finished. It finishes before we call connect. The Qt, QFuture, and QFuture Watch guarantee if it has finished here, it will call. It will. It, it will not wait for the for the event to actually arrive. At least that's what they say. As I said, QFuture is a really evil class that is completely designed after. Uh, implementing stuff to run in separate threads. So the things that I do for Dbus and other stuff just screw up QFutures as much as they can because they're not meant to run in the same thread. And that's the main purpose that I want them to, to fulfill. OK. We still have time, so four questions, around 10 minutes. Anybody has any specific questions? If nothing else, you can always contact me on event.cukac at kd.org. Uh, apart from doing things like this, I really love C++, so you can ask me about lambdas or whatever <laughs> during lunch or similar things. The only thing that I would really like you all when you go to your firms is to upgrade your compilers. <laughs> In essence, the most evil part about C++ is that some people are still using 3.2 GCC and things like those. And a couple of times I even got bug reports stating I can't compile this under Red Hat 5.2 or something like that. And I said, I don't care. <laughs> So please upgrade everything that you can. <laughs> OK? Thank you, everyone.